Hey, my name is Alex and I'm the pastor of X Church. Thanks so much for taking time to watch this talk. I hope that it helps you experience God's love and gives you the tools you need to go and extend it to those around you. If you like what you hear today, please do me a favor and go to xchurch.com to get more information about our online church family or you can download the X Church app and stay involved no matter where you are or where you're living. If you are local to the Baldwin and St. Louis area, we'd love for you to join us in person Sundays at 10 a.m. Thanks so much, and here's the message. Well, hello. <laughs> Welcome to my living room. I'm just kidding, that would be weird. Um, we're doing something a little bit different today in case you can't tell why. Well, we're in our Acts series, yes? And the series is called, Can I Get a? Witness. Proud of you. And we've said this, church is the community of calling, collecting, comforting, and commissioning witnesses, right? And so we are looking at the earliest churches, the church that was started after Jesus died, rose again, and then went back into heaven, We've been going through several P words, right? We started with the purpose. We unpacked that statement. Then we talked about the power of witnesses. We unpacked the posture of witnesses. We dialogued, right, about the prayer of witnesses. But today, the title of this part, it's the second to last one, is the positions of witnesses. There are different roles within this family and body. And so today, this is going to be more of a theological journey discussion than it is going to be a typical message. This is not my mode. Um, this is not normal for me. But I think it's good for us because we do have a lot of folks that come from a different church backgrounds that make up this church, X church, this family. And so I think it's good for us to get some clarity on how church works. Am I right? We understand that we are to first and foremost experience God's love together and go and extend it. That's the great commission, right? It's the greatest commandments. But what does the structure look like? Some of you are structure order people. Where are you at today? Raise your hands. All right, that's not me. That's okay. So the point is today, I want to unpack that. But before I do, we've got to go to our proof text. So we're going to be in Acts chapter 6 this morning, Acts chapter 6. And I'm actually going to be reading out of the NLT for just a minute here. Acts 6 beginning in verse 1. Here's what it says. But as the believers rapidly multiplied, there were rumblings of discontent. The Greek-speaking believers complained about the Hebrew-speaking believers, saying that their widows were being discriminated against in the distribution of food. So the 12 called a meeting of the believers. They said, we apostles should spend our time teaching the word of God, not running a food program. Other translations say not serving tables. That word serving there is important and we'll come back to it. And so brothers, select seven men who are well-respected and are full of the spirit and wisdom. We will give them this responsibility. Then we apostles can spend our time in prayer and teaching the word. Everyone liked this idea and they chose the following. Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit. Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas of Antioch, an earlier convert to the Jewish faith. These seven were presented to the apostles who prayed for them as they laid their hands on them. So God's message continued to spread. The number of believers greatly increased in Jerusalem and many of the Jewish priests were converted too. So what I think is interesting here is the church is growing and as a body, as a family grows, it adds family members, okay? As a entity or organization grows, right? So does the flow chart, amen? And so here we see a need arise as they multiply to add additional people in the infrastructure. And so today we are experiencing, even in the midst of a global pandemic, a multiplication. Proof is in the pudding. We are full today, right? We are full today. The first time in a little bit, it's been getting better, and that's exciting. 
and many of you are watching online today. Thanks for tuning in. Maybe it's your first time. Welcome, and I hope that this doesn't bore you, but rather gives you a greater understanding of who we are as a local church. Amen? And so um, I want to say it this way. Why these positions? Well, here it is. It'll be up on the screen for those of you who are in the room today. Positions provide productive witnesses. Can I say that again? Positions provide productive witnesses. When there's a proper order and flow, more can get done, right? And all of my engineers and all of my spreadsheet people um, rejoice, yes? Okay, so uh, there is also in church a negative or downside when this doesn't happen, am I right? So I've seen this before. I grew up um, in a Baptist church. Some people maybe in this room grew up differently, or maybe even though you weren't Baptist, your church was governed like this. There was a pastor, yes, but more important than the pastor was the almighty committee. Anybody know about this, right? The committee. And I was talking to one of our elders who shall remain nameless, okay, but he used to belong to a church that had lots of committees, I'm not making this up. He told me this on the phone. They had a decoration committee, a committee that literally only got together to vote on and discuss decoration. Have you ever seen a home that's decorated by committee? It's a nightmare. Am I right? Come on, let's be honest. Watch Fixer Upper, all right? Joanna Gaines takes nobody's input and for good reason, okay? She knows what she's doing. Okay, so when we came into this space, I said, Mom, do what you will. I have no interest in trying to determine what this is going to look like. She's about to walk the expansion in just a minute to help me plan the next phase of decor. So if you don't like it, send her the email, not me. (laughs) Anyways, getting back on track. And so I'll never forget um, thinking about this because Here's how it would work. There'd be a pastor, and then there'd be a board, maybe a board of deacons, right? And then the deacons would sit as a representative on all the different committees. Does your head hurt yet? Okay, and then they would be like a representative for that committee trying to accomplish and steer the you know, course of the conversation in the right direction, but to no avail. Then once the committee decides what they're going to do, they bring it back to all the deacons. Then all the deacons have to vote and make sure they're comfortable with that, and the pastor has to like it. And then if it's a big deal, they bring it before the church, and then um, they vote. But before they can vote, everybody dies of old age, and then nothing happens. I'm just kidding. But you get where I'm going with this. Now, please understand I'm not saying that this is sinful, but I think that there's a better way, amen? And we see that modeled in the patterns of the earliest churches throughout the New Testament, and that's what I want to look at. I'll never forget walking into the sanctuary. That's what they would call this kind of area at a local church recently, and I noticed that the carpet um, was weird because some of it was blue, but then some of it was red, and I thought, this is so weird, And I said to somebody, what happened? Like jokingly, could they not agree on the color of the carpet? And they looked at me deadpan and said, absolutely, it was a bloodbath. That's exactly what happened. (laughs) Nobody could agree. So they finally decided to create this horrendous combination of, I'm serious, blue and red carpet so that everyone would be happy. This is what happens. It looked like the 1980s were trying to do the 1950s in 2018 right? Now, I joke, we all have our quirks and issues. No church is perfect, amen? But I share that to say this. I think sometimes when the positions aren't right, we're not very productive, and we miss out on witnessing, which is what we're called to do. We miss out on the calling people to Christ, the collecting people into a family, the comforting those who are hurting, and the commissioning those to go back out and use their gifts to serve God and others. Amen? And so that's what I really want us to dive into today. So put your thinking caps on. We're going to go to Bible college for just the next 30 minutes or so, and uh, we're going to unpack the different positions that we see throughout the New Testament and come back to this specific passage. There we go in Acts chapter six in just a minute. You with me so far? All right, let's pray. 
God, first and foremost, I pray that these are not my words, but they are yours. Lord, I ask that you would give me wisdom as I teach from your word. Father, I pray that we would not just be hearers only, Lord, just getting head knowledge, but rather we would be doers of your word and be blessed in our doing, Lord Jesus, so that more people may come to know of your incredible love. We pray all of this in your name, amen. So the very first position I want to unpack today is the role of elder. So maybe you've heard that term before, elder. Maybe you grew up in a context where there were elders in your church. I wanna start with each of these roles and explain what they're not first, because I think that that's helpful, because maybe you're carrying some baggage, or maybe you didn't grow up in church, you're a new believer in Jesus, and you're still trying to figure this out, so you don't have the baggage. Congratulations, right? But maybe you understand or have heard this title before. We have elders in our church, right? So Kevin Dill is an elder. My dad, Mike, who was just up here a moment ago, is an elder. Ed Henderson is an elder. Harley Davis is an elder. And then I'm an elder, and we'll get there in a second. But elders are not advisors. See, I think that in some cultures and contexts, there's this pastor who functions as the dictator, Right? He functions as the end-all, be-all, and he has elders, but the elders are really just there to sort of give input and suggestion, and then he can still do whatever he wants. I've been a part of one of these churches before. But no, 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 these roles are very important because these are leadership roles. Right? These are really important roles. And so I want to say it this way. And again, it'll be on the screen. It'll be in the notes if you've got the app. I believe that instead we see the elders in scripture are overseeing and modeling. That is their role. They are overseers and they are modelers okay, of the good news of Jesus. I want to read some scripture today out of 1 Peter chapter 5. So I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ. Pause. So notice here that he says elders, plural. Typically in a church, there's more than one elder, right? The idea is that we work together, okay, and we hold each other accountable, amen? And so he says, hey, I exhort or I encourage the elders. Also, you should know that there are about three different words in the Greek that all mean or are translated um, differently, but are all talking about the same office or the same position, right? Um, some have to do with more leadership or more oversight or, or one is more about shepherding, but they're all in there and that's important to know. And so he says this, he says, hey, um, shepherd the flock of God that is among you. Exercising oversight, right? Overseeing. Not under compulsion, but willingly as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge. Do you hear the language that he's using here? It's really important. Then he says this, but being examples, right? That's the modeling piece, but being examples to the flock. And then when the chief shepherd, that's Jesus, by the way, appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So that's really what elders do. They oversee the day-to-day um, direction of God's church and the ministry and what he's called us to do. And we see that there are elders set up in different local churches all throughout the areas surrounding where the apostles were preaching, right? And so you might be wondering, well, who can be an elder, right? How does that happen? How is an elder selected? I want to unpack that today. So in 1 Timothy chapter 3, we have the Apostle Paul, church planter, missionary, important guy. He's writing to Timothy, a young pastor, right? So Timothy is overseeing a collection of churches um, in Ephesus. And so here's what, here's what we see in 1 Timothy chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. This is a trustworthy saying. If someone aspires to be an elder... 
He desires an honorable position. So an elder must be a man whose life is above reproach. He must be faithful to one wife. He must exercise self-control, live wisely, and have a good reputation. He must enjoy having guests in his home, and he must be able to teach. I want to pause there. So far, all of the requirements have to do with character. There's only one competency requirement is what we call it, and that's that they have to be able to teach God's word because that's how they're going to oversee, right? That's how they're going to shepherd is through God's and under God's word, what God says about life and how we're to live and treat others and worship him. Am I making sense so far? I know this is a lot, but I hope it's helpful today. Here we go. He must not be a heavy drinker or be violent. He must be gentle, not quarrelsome, and not love money. He must manage his own family well, having children who respect and obey him. For if a man cannot manage his own household, how can he take care of God's church? An elder must not be a new believer because he might become proud and the devil would cause him to fall. Also, people outside the church must speak well of him so that he will not be disgraced and fall into the devil's trap. So that's a lot, right? And so I want us to make this distinction really ultimately it's somebody with integrity. If we're gonna boil that down, it's somebody who has integrity. And what we're gonna talk about here in just a minute about elders and who can be elders, this is what we call a secondary issue. Do you guys know what that means? I'll explain it. It means that, it means this. It means that it's not essential to the gospel message of Jesus, right? That Jesus died and rose again and he has saved us by his grace and he adopts us and he makes us new. He comes into our life. He forgives us of our past. That's the gospel, amen? We're becoming new creations. We become a new creation, excuse me, when we put our full faith in Christ. But there are these other things in scripture, these patterns that we see. And so today, I want to give you what I believe um, we see here in this text. But there are some that disagree with me and with our elder team and with our church's position on this. But we believe um, as a church, as ex-church, that this role is specific to men. We do believe that. And, and there's reason. It's not just because uh, um, we, we think that that's a good idea, okay? No, 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 no. But rather, it's what God says. So if we go back just a couple verses in chapter two of 1 Timothy. Um, Here's what we read, ready? Let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. And everybody on YouTube turned it off. Okay, so please (laughs) hear me, all right? That's a hard verse, right? What do you do with that verse? Yeah? Um, On Thursday, I felt very confident in my outline And then I went, you know what? I've got to go here. The Holy Spirit was pushing me and said, you got to take this all the way through and provide the context. And I went, but I don't want to because I don't want anybody to misunderstand this position, right? But this is what God's word teaches. Now, I want you to know something, okay? This is in the context of what we just read in chapter three. Don't you know, right, that the numbers were not inspired, the words were. So in other words, the translators have added the chapters and the verses for our ease of use, but this is one continuous idea. So chapter two, chapter three, it's one run-on idea. So when he starts to talk about women and teaching and leadership, he's about to set the stage, okay, for eldership, okay, and this very specific position in the church, Am I making sense again today? I'm gonna keep asking that. I want to know you're with me because this is crunchy, but it's good. Now, here's what we see. There is an argument that can be made. Well, in the context of 1 Timothy, Timothy is a young pastor, probably my age or younger, some scholars believe, right? Um, And he was getting bullied by um, older widows in the church trying to have their way. I can, I can believe that that's true. I can believe that that happened, okay? I'm just gonna tell you, as a pastor and as a young pastor, I, I, can, I can definitely see that. Um, and so that's what 
it's talking about. Or, or some might say, well, in that day, this is cultural because women were uneducated and um, that's why they can't speak up in church. Or, or maybe it's that in that culture, men and women would sit on different sides of the room or in different rooms even um, to separate themselves. That still happens in other churches around the world, in case you didn't know that. And so it would be disruptive for them to teach and for them to talk and that sort of thing. And, and I hear those arguments and there's a part of me that really like likes those arguments and can get behind that. But again, we've got to go back to the context and full view of the whole Bible, right? We got to go back to the whole Bible. First of all, we don't see any New Testament examples of women as elders, right? In the church specifically, we don't see any women holding this position. But furthermore, Paul does not ground his argument in a cultural way. He grounds it in a creation way. What do I mean by that? Well, let's keep reading, right? Let's keep reading it, not just cherry picking that out of context, but unpacking it. So then it says here, he says this. He says, hey, here's why. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And it was not Adam who was deceived by Satan. The woman was deceived and sin was the result. Now, guys, we love to blame Eve, but I want you to understand the context again. I'm gonna use that word a lot too. If we go back to the Garden of Eden, where all this got started at the beginning of your Bibles in Genesis, Genesis chapter three is where we read about the fall of man. So if you're new to this, let me explain. That's where man and woman sinned for the very first time. God said, hey, there's a tree. It's got really good looking fruit on it. Don't eat that fruit, right? I'm paraphrasing, please understand. I got a lot to get through. And Satan shows up and says to Eve, hey, did he really say that you can't eat it, right? He begins to twist God's words in her mind. Long story short, she gives in. She eats, but it says then that she gave some to her husband who was with her. See, as a kid in Sunday school, it was not depicted as such. I always saw Eve by herself eating of the fruit on that forbidden tree. But it says that he was with her letting this happen, right? Like he's a spectator and then she gives him some and he willingly eats of it. Now, fast forward, God's not dumb, he's God and he knows what has happened. So he addresses man, not Eve. He addresses Adam. What's going on, man? Again, paraphrasing. Adam goes, well, this woman that you gave me, right? She did this thing, playing the blame game. Anybody like to play the blame game? I do, right? If I can make it not about me every time, I will try to divert. Just me? Okay, that's fine. If you're all better people than I am, it's okay, right? But, but, but seriously, though, he says, well, this woman, and he goes, no, 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 no. You were there dude, and you just let it happen. So he curses them as a result of their disobedience because he says you did not, he, <clears throat> excuse me, he says because you listened, there we go, to your wife. Now, I want you to understand something. Men, it is biblical good and absolutely right to listen to your wife and to listen to her often, okay? I just want you to understand something, okay? Because God said it was good, um, but then he said it was not good that man should be alone. Amen, right, guys? Yeah? Come on, you should be more convincing, especially those who have a spouse next to them. Okay, so <laughs> here we go. Um, here's what Paul is saying in this text. God has set up men in the family and in the church to be the spiritual head. We see it in Ephesians chapter five, that they are to love, protect, and guide their wives in an honoring way as Christ, Jesus, loves us, the church, amen? And so what he's saying is, guys, it's time to pull up your big boy pants and assume the spiritual leadership role that God literally designed you to take hold of. 
That's what he's saying in this text. It does not mean that women cannot teach or that women don't have value or leadership in the church. I want to make that very clear. We need you women badly. Could you imagine if the world or any organization operated without women? It would be a nightmare. Am I right? Is it just me? Come on, guys. Again, you should be more convincing right now. (sighs) So what we see here is actually when he's talking about teaching and oversight, it's in the context, yes, of the marriage relationship. And by the way, just because we have different roles, it doesn't mean that we aren't equal. Let me say that again. Just because we have different roles, it doesn't mean that we aren't equal. And it doesn't mean that one of us brings less to the table than the other. Am I making sense? Right? And so he's saying that in the context of this role, it belongs to a man. But here's what's cool. We see in other places of scripture, okay, like in 1 Corinthians 11, he gives instructions for women when they are praying and when they are prophesying in church, right? We see in Acts chapter 18, uh, verse 26, we see a couple, Priscilla and Aquila, right? And so some scholars believe that they were deacons in the church, okay? And Priscilla and her husband see a guy named Apollos preaching. And Apollos is a really good teacher, but he's got a couple of theological issues, okay? He doesn't understand all the stuff yet. And so it says that Priscilla and her husband together approach Apollos and they correct him and show him the full truth about Jesus. So we see women teaching, right, in that capacity. Um, In Acts 21, verse 9, it says that Philip the evangelist had four daughters, and they had the gift of prophecy, which you might be thinking, what does that mean? It means they spoke on God's behalf, and they shared what God was doing and what he wanted to communicate to that church and to those people. And then we see in Titus chapter two, the apostle Paul is writing to another young pastor, okay? And he says, hey, I want you to teach the women to teach women. So we actually see specific commands in scripture where these women are to teach and are to lead and are to train. So we're just talking about this role. There's a divine difference between men and women and that is good and I'm thankful for that difference. And then the second position today is pastors. Now you might be thinking, wait a minute. I thought pastors and elders were the same. I thought those words were the same in Greek. They are, but I want to make a little bit of a difference. I want to make a little bit of a difference, a pattern that we see. Now, before we unpack the differences between pastors and elders, and if there really is a difference, um, I want to say this again, I alluded it to it earlier. I alluded to it earlier. There we go. Pastors are not dictators. Uh, My title is lead pastor, right? But it does not mean that I can do whatever I want and everybody cheered, right? (laughs) Come on. Um, I'm thankful that I have elders and that I am one of five votes at a table, right? Those guys help me make decisions. However, we see in scripture and we see from Timothy and Titus in particular a model okay, of this leadership or this lead or senior pastor. Maybe you heard it that way, okay? And so I wanna say that this way, and it'll be up on the screen again for those in the room, this role is that of leading and teaching or leading through teaching is maybe another way you could say it. I wanna pick up here in 1 Timothy yet again, beginning in verse 17 of chapter five. Let the elders who rule, Let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor. So that word rule there, it can mean lead or manage, okay? It's a very specific word there. Rule or manage, be worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. For the scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain and the laborer deserves his wages. I very much so appreciate this passage (laughs) because it just means that, um, We're supposed to pay our pastor, and I really appreciate that that's in there. Not that I wouldn't do this for free because I love you guys, but it's helpful. You know what I'm trying to say? It's a joke. Calm down. Okay, anyways. (laughs) He's saying that there is this role 
where these guys, now they're all able to teach, yes? So they all teach, but there is this role of like primary teaching. We see this also in 1 Timothy chapter four, beginning in verse six, that Timothy has this very specific calling and this very specific gifting. And his job later on in that passage is not only to teach and to lead, but to set an example and to appoint other leaders, right? And to appoint other faithful men to teach. And so we see that there is this role that Timothy has amongst the elders to lead and to guide them. And then we also see this in Titus, right? So Titus is a young guy pastoring on the island of Crete. And this is what Paul writes at the beginning of that book to him, that letter to him, Titus, my true child and a common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Savior. This is why I left you in Crete so that you might put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. Now, I want to make this distinction and make it clear, okay? So I may be the lead pastor, okay, which means that um, I am responsible for teaching and guiding and um, listening to God and gaining vision from God about who we are and where we're going, okay? But I want you to understand, even in that language, you might have noticed it, that if we go back to 1 Peter chapter 5, when Peter is talking about the elders, he says, hey, there's a chief shepherd that's going to show up one day. His name is Jesus. And so I want to say it this way. I may be the lead pastor, but Jesus Christ is the senior pastor of X Church, okay? So I just want you guys to understand that. He's the senior pastor, okay? So if I come to the elders with a good idea, that's one thing but they'd prefer that I come to them with a God idea. And usually they'll let me know, okay, um, if it's a good idea or a God idea. And usually if it's not a God idea, it's probably not a good idea either. So anyways, that's that little nuance there, that role. So we have that position of a lead pastor. And I want to say this. It's a privilege that I get to be your pastor. It's a privilege that you call me your pastor. Um, I am so blessed and thankful to be your pastor. It's really awesome and it's humbling because some of you are old enough to be my grandparents. Some of you are old enough to be my parents. Some of you are my parents and some of you are my grandparents. (laughs) And I love that. And I don't take that lightly. Um, I labored over this message this week um, because I take this responsibility seriously. And I want to say this, and I want to say this about our elders. They give a lot of time. They have families. They have full-time jobs. Okay, they do not take a dime from this church. And they spend a lot of energy to lead, direct, guide, and bless you all. And so we're benefactors of their time and the talent and the treasure that they give. So make sure you thank an elder today. Um, I think that that would be pretty cool. Um, I don't know what I would do without them. Um, they, they know that when I show up on caller ID, it's a 45-minute deal at best. Like that's best case scenario, right? Um, so they, 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 am I right, guys? I mean, I can just do it without your input, but I don't think that that's the solution either. <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, I appreciate you guys. And so um, I, did, I did hear Kevin say this, and I'm going to quote Kevin. Um, he said, some people, you know, think that it's glamorous and it's awesome to have a leadership role in the church. Um, and, and while it is a blessing, it, it is a big responsibility. And he said it this way. He said, calling comes at a cost, not comfort. Yeah, calling comes at a cost, not comfort. And it's true, it does. You're like our children. <laughs> You're like my kids. I, I, I think about you. I lie awake at night and I, and I pray for you. And, and when you hurt, I hurt. And, and we just love you and we're so thankful. And I love that you're here today and I love that you're watching online today. And I long to see some of you. Laws, I know you're watching, John. I, I, I said it in a text to you yesterday, I think it was, that I miss seeing you guys, but I love knowing that you're with us virtually and in spirit. Um, and I know that you're praying for me, and so thank you for your prayers. So thirdly, if I could keep going, and I'm almost done, um, there's this role of deacons. So if we go back to Acts chapter 6, okay, um, we see what's happening. The leaders of the church, the apostles, the elders, the teachers, 
they're saying, hey, our, our job is to oversee, our job is to teach, our job is to church plant and keep the ministry going, but we can't do that and run this food program is how it says it in the NLT or serve tables, right? And um, what I think is really interesting uh, about that is, is that the early church, they had a mechanism to meet physical needs in their community. Isn't that cool? And I think that they did that very strategically. One, because it showed the love of God, but I also believe that it provided an opportunity for them to also meet needs spiritually, yes? And so they said, hey, we need to find some people, some guys who are full of the spirit, right? Who are just excited about what God is doing and we need to put them in this role. And so I wanna say it this way. Um, Deacons, they're not rulers, they're not leaders. So again, in some old school church models, a deacon, excuse me, would operate more like an elder, right? They would have a vote, they would have influence, they would have some sort of leadership role. But really what we see in Acts is actually more so the opposite. They're servants, they're there to encourage and to build up and to strengthen the church. And so I wanna say it this way, deacons fulfill their calling by administrating and caring, right? There was some admin work here. There was a distribution um, system to get these uh, women food and it wasn't working. There was a breakdown because of the language barrier, most likely and those sorts of things. And so there, there is this administrative side, I think you could argue, but also there's this care side to love on people, right? And to come alongside of them and to encourage them. And that's really what deacons are. And you might be wondering, well, where did you get the word deacon? Well, that word there, serve, it's actually, it's a Greek word, and it's diakonos, right? So that's the, that's the Greek word for serve, which is where we get the word deacon, okay? So that's where that comes from. And you might be wondering, well, who can be a deacon? How does that work? And you might be thinking, do we have deacons? The short answer is no, we don't. And... Here's why. Just like the earliest churches, when they first started, they didn't either, right? Because the deacons were added as the ministry grew and then they were implemented. And once they were implemented, they became more productive. Remember, because the positions provide productive witnesses. Yeah, see, it's all coming full circle. And now it says that they multiplied even more once they instituted the deacons. And so what I'm telling you today is we as an elder team have decided that we're going to be implementing and raising up deacons who are gonna serve and care and meet the needs of our church because we just can't, do all that and do what we're doing, leading the groups and all the things that we've got going on. And so we're gonna be implementing that over the next coming months and years and seeing people raised up to serve their church. I'm really excited about it. So the question is, who can be deacons? Glad you asked. Here we go. First Timothy again, chapter three. So right after Paul gives Timothy all the instructions, right, about who the, you know, elders can be, he then pivots to who the deacons can be. Here's what it says. It's very similar. In the same way, deacons, diakonos, right? That word means servant, or it can also mean minister. I want to come back to that later. Must be well-respected and have integrity. They must not be heavy drinkers or dishonest with money. They must be committed to the mystery of the faith, now revealed, and must live with a clear conscience. Before they are appointed as deacons, let them be closely examined. If they pass the test, then let them serve as deacons. In the same way, their wives must be respected and must not slander others. They must exercise self-control and to be faithful in everything they do. A deacon must be faithful to his wife and he must manage his children and household well. Those who do well as deacons will be rewarded with respect from others and will have increased confidence in their faith in Christ Jesus. Please don't lose me on this. I promise I'm almost done, but I think this is cool. So the answer to this question is a little bit different, all right? So maybe you grew up in a more traditional context, okay? Hear me out. Um, one of the things that we notice in 1 Timothy is the word wives. I want to unpack that for just a second. So the word in Greek can also mean woman. There's only one word for woman and wife. I want to note that, okay? And so you have to translate that word based upon the context, yeah? Well, 
What's interesting is you would say, well, it says their wives. So if it said their women, you would translate it wife, and we have. But there's a problem because the word there isn't there. Right? That's interesting to me. Some of you just leaned in. It's good. So that would not be enough for me to change my mind, but it's certainly interesting, and I wanted to bring it up to you as we have studied this as an elder team, okay? So it could translate to the women deacons or the women, right? And then it pivots back again to the men. That's one idea. But again, we've got to look at all the scripture and all the evidence, amen? Because that's important to do. So whereas with elders, we don't see any examples, right, in the New Testament of elders being women, we do see examples of women serving in official capacities with churches. Let me unpack here in Romans chapter 16. This is also, again, the apostle church planter Paul writing a letter to the church in Rome. He says, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, who is a deacon in the church of Sancria. Now, some translations will render that servant, okay? But there are other words for servant, first of all. I want to note that, right? So there are there could have been another word here used for servant, but the word there that appears is diakonos, right? That's the word that shows up, okay? The word for deacon, it shows up there, okay? Also, not only that, but it says of the church of Sancreo, which I think is interesting, right? So he, he almost makes it sound like, hey, she's coming from this church. She serves in this church, but it gets more interesting because then he says this. He says, welcome her in the Lord as one who is worthy of honor among God's people, right? So if we go back to what we read about deacons, it says that deacons will be rewarded with respect. So he is, he is asking the church when they greet her to treat her with this certain level of worthiness or respect because she's a servant from this church. He says, give my, sorry, let me back up because this is important. He says, help her in whatever she needs for she has been helpful to many and especially to me. So it, it appears as though she's worked alongside of Paul, an apostle in some capacity. And then he says, give my greetings to Priscilla. Again, this couple, Priscilla, and Aquila, my co-workers in the ministry of Christ Jesus. And again, that word ministry, the word ministry, okay, is diakonias or diakonis, however you want to choose to, there's a way to pronounce that. It doesn't matter. Anyways, the point is, it's ministry. Now, here's what happens in churches. Let me walk this through. Men can be elders and pastors. Men can be deacons, but women cannot. But you know what women can be in those churches? They can be children's ministry directors. Have you heard this? Right? They can be, you know, directors of women's ministry. They can be, you know, administrative directors. Fill in the blank. Okay? The word deacon, the word servant, okay, is the word also for ministry, which I think is interesting. So I think if we're going to apply this, okay, we need to be consistent with God's word. We need to be consistent. So what we see here is these women being exceptionally helpful and important to this church, to these churches, right? And so we believe based upon this teaching that this role is a servant role. And the reason we feel comfortable with that as an elder team, and some will disagree, again, this is a secondary non-essential idea, okay, is because this is not a leadership teaching oversight role. So it's consistent with Paul's mandate that women are not to serve in a teaching or a leadership role. That's not what this is. This is a serving role within the church. And we need women to serve. And let me tell you, again, church, we'd be a disaster if women weren't serving um, as ministry directors. Somebody say amen. Because you don't want me in charge of the children's ministry, that's for sure. And you definitely don't want me in charge of the women's ministry, right? Like, that would be a disaster for many reasons. Thanks, Wyatt. So we see this. Um, I see this in, in, in my life because we have several folks in our church that I think 
um, they, they exemplify what that looks like. Okay, and they serve in those capacities. Wyatt, who I just called out, Wyatt serves our student ministry, very similar to what a deacon does, right? So Wyatt loves on those guys. He texts them. He reaches out to them. He prays for them. He's been working on some curriculum that uh, we might be using for um, the fall in teaching kids how to share their faith. And he helps plan the games and he shares out of his own life and just encourages them and, and is an example to them, right? He cares and he helps with some of the administrative tasks, tasks, excuse me, of our student ministry. So that's kind of what a deacon is. He serves kind of like a deacon, right? Um, You've heard me say this before, but God bless Kristen Carlton, who is our administrator and our treasurer, amen? Yeah, like seriously, okay? Um, she helps provide all the, I mean, I don't even know what she does, actually. I couldn't even tell you because the list is too long. And what's funny is she goes, um, I kind of kept my gifts secret for a long time. And my role at work, a secret, because in my conservative church culture, it wasn't cool that I was, you know, successful in the corporate business world as a woman. And, it, and, and there weren't opportunities for women to serve the church the way that I want to serve the church. Sure, I could be the children's ministry director, and she was for a brief time. She's like, but Lord knows that ain't where you want me long term, right? I got other gifts, right? And so when we finally realized what she was capable of, we were like, what? This is amazing. So we need men and we need women serving and administrating and caring for this body. Because I can't do it by myself. And Lord knows that me and my wife can't handle all of it and the elders can't handle all of it. We need those people in those positions. And so we're gonna be, we're gonna be approaching and we're gonna be building up those roles and installing those folks soon, people who we, who we as an elder team feel meet those requirements according to scripture, we're gonna lay hands on them and we're gonna let them just care for and use their gifts to serve this church. Isn't that exciting? I'm excited about that. And then I believe the pattern was once they did that, it says they multiplied again. Hey, because they honored what God had asked them to do. So as I wrap this up, I wanna end with the most important position the most important position in a church. Do you know what it is? It's you, the members. It's not me. Let me say that again. It's not me. If you ever see my face on a billboard, just turn in your membership card, okay? <laughs> it's not about me. Yeah. It's not about me. What? What? Come on. All right, you know what? I mean, I could. I could do that. You know, actually, maybe the, all the elders could get up there. You know what I mean? We could. Okay. It's not approved in the budget. No. It's not approved in the budget. There we go. It's not approved. It's not approved. All right. It's good. <clears throat> um, I want to say this. Again, what aren't members, right? Let's start with what they aren't. Members aren't spectators. If you think that, that that's your role, oh my goodness, you're missing out on what church is. You're missing out on what church is. If you've ever been made to feel like a spectator in a local church, it's not right. You're not doing it. I'll never forget. A couple years back, my wife and I attended a Christmas Eve service at a church. And um, a church, uh, um, not local. And... I'll never forget walking in. It was all decked out. It was very professional. It was a big church. We walk into the big building. We sit down, and it's all quiet, and there's all this anticipation, and there's pre-service music and graphics, and we're all you know, sitting around and whatever, and we do some of that here, okay? And then, and then a, a pastor walks out on stage, welcome to fill in the blank church. You know, it's this big moment. Welcome to this experience. Just listen to the language. Welcome to fill in the blank. We're so glad you're here. Our team, keep listening, has been cultivating and putting together this, this 
experience for you. And so now you just sit back and relax as we, as we bless you with this experience. I've been to churches where that's how they start their service. Welcome to blank church. Welcome to blank. You know, like they don't even drink. They just drop church off because it's cooler, you know, right? Not that that's wrong. I'm just trying to give you a picture here. And what it does is notice the language. Welcome to, we're glad you're here. We've made it about a, a, a place, right? That's a problem. And then, and then it's, it's, it's we, the entity, have put this on for you, the spectators. See? Uh, we try to use really strategic language as a church. We, we refer to you as X church, right? We call this building the space. By the way, I'm getting it priced this week. There's gonna be a big giant sign right outside that new front door that says the space. Because you know what? We just need to remind people that this is the space. It's not X church. There'll be a sign that says X church, but there'll be a big sign that says, this is the space where X church meets to remind you when you walk through the door that you are X church, right? You're the church. So what are members? They're ministers. Your job is to minister and to testify. To minister and to testify. That's your job. To be the church. To do the thing. To experience and extend God's love. I love what it says in 1 Corinthians 12. For just as one body has many members, eyes, ears, mouths, fingers, and all the members of one body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. But here's where we get this idea that we're one body but many members or we get that idea there, but then here's where we get the idea of ministry as a wrap up. It says this in Ephesians 4, and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, the teachers to equip the saints, the members, you, with the work of ministry. You're the ministers. For building up the body of Christ until we attain to the unity of the fullness of Christ, then we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced by people when they try to trick us with lies so clever that they sound like the truth. That's happening right now in our culture today. Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head, right, the senior pastor of his body, the church. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly as each part does its own special work. It helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. You have a special work to do, to minister and to testify, to be a witness to say, man, I wanna just tell the world about what God has done. It says in 1 Peter 4, 10, that you've been given a spiritual gift. If you trust in Jesus, use that gift to serve one another. Amen? In an old school church, they'd call the guy that leads the singing, the minister of music, right? I am not, nor have I ever been a minister of music. I have no interest in being a minister of music. But you know what? You know who is a minister of music? Matt. Dolan is a minister of music. Every time Matt gets up here and he slaps the bass, by the way, aren't you thankful for real bass? Come on. Oof, it's good stuff. I, can, I told him today, I said, I, said I, can, I can hear you, but more importantly, I can feel you. That's where it's at, right? You minister through your music. That's what minister of music is. Not some guy that gets paid to stand up here and sing, Right? You minister through your gifts. You all minister. Kristen ministers with spreadsheets, right? We all minister in different ways. Thank you for using your gifts to minister. You guys are good at that. 
You guys are really good at that. Dylan, thanks for being the minister of lighting today. Jared, you are the minister of video today. If it wasn't for you, all the folks at home could not see me right now. Thank you. It's awesome. Am I right? Come on. You're ministers. You have a special work to do. You have a special work to do. So as we wrap up today, I, I, I gave us a lot of stuff to think about, right? My encouragement to you today is this. If you're not sure where you are with faith or ex-church or being a minister, we are creating a new tool. It's called Explore. It's in beta right now. So if you're on Facebook right now, Mike has dropped a link in the comment thread where you can go and click that link. Or what you can do is you can actually um, go download the X Church app. And today at two o'clock, there will be a button that's gonna show up on that app called Explore. And when you hit that, what it's gonna do is it's gonna allow you to explore your next step in experiencing and extending God's love. You can explore things like salvation. You can explore things like baptism. You can explore things like membership and what we believe as a church and what it would look like for you to join our family in a more formal way and to get questions answered. You can explore what it looks like to serve and to use your gifts. And maybe you're trying to figure out what those gifts are. We're going to help you figure it out and get you implemented. Maybe you want to, maybe you want to explore what it looks like to give and to bless financially, whether you're in person or you're online and you want to give of what God has blessed you with to serve his people and his mission. We want to create opportunities for you to explore these avenues. So when you fill out that form, we're going to be in touch with you with resources. And so I'm really excited about that. It's in beta because eventually there's going to be some videos attached and I'm really excited about those. But look for that in the app or go to Facebook, find this live stream. It'll be in the comment thread. Fill it out. Um, I want to baptize some people. Yeah? There are some folks, okay, I know in our church that you've put your full faith in Jesus, but you've not made a profession of faith yet and said, hey, like, I want to, I want to get baptized, and I want people to know what Jesus has done in my life. Right? Let's baptize some people before it gets cold. Because that's, we've done that. It's not fun. All right? I want to some people, I want to see some people join this family. Right? I want to see people serving and using their gifts because the most important position is yours, remember? So go be a witness today. Amen? Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for the many positions, but Lord, we're just honored that you want to use us. Broken, messed up people who <laughs> have experienced your love through Jesus. Lord, I pray that, Father, you would help people, whether they're online or in the room today, take their next step in exploration. Whether that's, hey, I want to know more about what it means to trust Jesus as my Savior, or hey, I want to get information about what it would mean to be baptized, or hey, I want to, I want to give, or hey, I want to serve, I want to use my gifts, or fill in the blank. God, I pray that we would leave here knowing that we've been given a great position to minister to others and to testify and to witness and tell of what you've done in our lives. So give us the boldness to do that because we're living in a world that so desperately needs to know the good news and the love of your son, Jesus. We pray all this in his name, amen. I hope you've experienced God's love in this place. Now go and extend it. See you next time.